Hello folks, here I come to you right at Faneuil Hall. Faneuil Hall being the cradle of the American Revolution and so many wonderful things that have happened here. And I'm here the night before opening. You know, we've been in quarantine obviously all this many weeks and tonight's the last night. Not necessarily the whole kind of opening back up to the normal, but part of the transition. So I figured I'll come here for the final night and tomorrow we're all going back to work. Of course, I've been back to work all these uh, weeks, but I figured what I'm going to do for you tonight to share with you some of the ways we're going to be implementing some of the new ways we're going to be working with patients. I just share with you some of my ideas in this area. So let's uh, go up to the uh, Boston Harbor and talk about that. There obviously are a difference between those offices that are endodontic offices and general dental offices. And by the way, I have no idea why I'm wearing a mask since I'm here alone. Just with my son. Okay, so to keep things in perspective, what we do in endodontic offices, we see two different types of patients. Uh, one, patients we see for consultation in order to come up with a treatment plan for treatment, and then treatment patients that come in for the actual treatment plan, which we have either devised during a consultation or it's already been determined by the general dentist, and so we need to do. Of course, uh, consultations are usually related to all kinds of different problems that people would have that we have to determine some kind of odontogenic source, and the treatments are oftentimes, you know, they run the gamut of non-surgical or surgical kind of treatments and so on and so forth but those are the two main types of patients that we end up seeing and what I have found is for consultations what I find to be most effective again the fact is that we need to make sure that patients visits to our office are as short as possible so that we don't end up having too much interaction in the waiting room with too many patients obviously with the social distancing rules and things like that we don't want to have too many people in the waiting room so we need to have patients come in and leave the office very efficiently so we can make these 10 to 15 minute appointments for the consultation with the goal of essentially just gathering data and information from the patients so the patient comes in we quickly take our radiographs and our CT and then we go through the seven uh, diagnostic steps that I have kind of uh, discussed in uh, my full diagnosis course at the Spear Education was the seven step process but essentially we get all the data that we need clinical data history and all those things from the patient and oftentimes they take a quick look at it and if it is a very quick and clear diagnosis we may actually discuss that with the patient but oftentimes things are complicated and when we have to discuss risk and benefits and optional treatments and all kinds of stuff and that takes too long so what we want to do at that point is we want the patient to leave I gather all the information and then would they make an appointment at the front desk on the way out to make an online telemedicine consultation with me or follow-up consultation with me which is the second phase of their consultation in which we discuss the treatment options that uh, I'm going to put together for them and discuss all the risk and benefits of the treatment that uh, were basically dis determined based on their clinical data. So I found that to be really good for many reasons. Number one is the fact that they end up not spending too much time in the office. They just kind of come in, they zoom in, sit down, we get their data, we kind of put together all the information together, and then they make a follow-up uh, call at the end of the day or maybe uh, the following day where I go over all the information and discuss the treatment options with them. Other benefit is the fact that, you know, if you have full PPE on and you're discussing all patients' treatment plans with them, it's very impersonal, just not my kind of brand of practice. You don't want to have a full mask on and a shield on and, you know, wear all your PPE and then discuss treatment planning options with your patients where they don't even recognize you, they don't even see you. I'd rather do that over the telemedicine where we can be without a mask, you know, at the safety of, of our homes discussing these masks and have ample time for discussion. So that's for the consultation patients. And this is all important to kind of be determined ahead of time. So the pre-appointment kind of uh, decision-making and, and discussion is very important to be communicated very clearly and concisely with your front desk staff to the patient so they understand everything ahead of time when they come in, what's gonna happen, what's involved, and so on and so forth. So next, let's quickly talk about our treatment patients and how we deal with them.
Okay, so what about treatment patients? For treatment patients, what we uh, prefer to do, again, the most important priority is to make sure that everything we do is very efficient. So I try to kind of do the case as efficiently as possible. Of course, that means that we're gonna have to run a lot of irrigation with negative pressure, and also maybe creating and achieving a little bit of a greater taper because that's going to help enhance the irrigation and also larger apical diameters will all help increase the removal of the biofilm. See, what you have to do with your treatment uh, of, um, uh, of disease because our goal is to remove the biofilm, your options are either to chemically disinfect the disease space by creating minimally invasive preparations that are very small but then rely on long-term irrigation and multiple step root canal therapy using calcium hydroxide or what you could do is you can maybe go to like a 06 taper like a 2506 taper and then get a larger apical diameter like a 303504 combine the two together and that'll give you a very nice uh, taper and apical diameter that is going to be far more efficient in terms of cutting and removing dentin than using any of the chemical means of irrigation and calcium hydroxide treatment. So that is one of the treatments I think are important philosophically in terms of what we try to do. And that also means for me to make sure that my access preparation is adequate enough so I can see things, I can find canals. Relying on my CBCT to do most of the treatment planning in advance and getting that information ahead of time is also very helpful because once I walk into the operatory, I know exactly what I'm going to do, what my goals are, how many canals there are, how I'm going to achieve my shape and where are the obstacles, where are the difficult areas, where the canals ask them together and I can pre treatment plan all of that so that as soon as I sit down with the patient chair side I'm just executing that as efficiently as possible that is a very important component again once again because of the fact that we're trying to limit the patient's stay at the office and at the same time most importantly we don't want to cut corners and make the effect of any less effective these are important uh, criteria. Now, when it comes to PPE during treatment, first and foremost, I want to just tell you that there really is no clear evidence that any of the previous universal precautions were inadequate for addressing this particular disease. There is a lot of heresies, a lot of speculation about like, well, the aerosol and this and that, but let me just tell you ahead of time that there really isn't any clear scientific evidence that says we need to do anything specifically more. Now, many people prefer the use of respirators and 95 and above rather than level three masks. That's certainly a person option I started by doing you know and 100 masks then you know I realized how uncomfortable they are I went to 95 masks and frankly nowadays I'm, I'm com completely comfortable just going with the level 3 masks but I'm making sure that I have a shield on and I'm covered well also making sure that you are covering your neck and your head and everything that is all very helpful too so essentially everything you would be doing if you're treating a surgery previously is now applies to all your non-surgical and surgical treatments as well as your consults so one other thing that I do for the treatment patients that we don't do for the consult patients is we also protect them with PPE. So when the patient walks into the office, we give them full PPE gear. They wear a gown, they wear a shoe covering, they wear bouffant or a head covering and a mask and an eye protection throughout the procedure that they're with me. And that I think is very important because they get a sense that, you know, we care about them as much as we care about ourselves. So the protection is mutual. That works very well. So the only time that they remove the mask is when I'm about to get started. During the procedure, obviously the use of the rubber dam is mandatory. So it's important to understand that aerosols are not created equal. Everybody is freaking out over aerosols in this particular situation. But once you're using a rubber dam, the aerosol that you're creating is not full of virus because you're separating the inside of the mouth from the outside of the mouth. So you just, as long as you have some good volume suction in the field, you can not only get most of the droplets that come out of the handpiece and so on, as well as the patient's breath, but you'd be protected. And also you'll be wearing a shield. So I think in that area, everybody is going to be protected and I don't see any particular risk. But just the main things I wanted to tell you is the fact that you need to make sure that you and your assistant are well protected and that you keep the duration of the appointment as short as possible. All right, well, heading back home now. It's uh, nighttime and uh, it is uh, tomorrow, bright and early. Got to get back to work. It's obviously very eerily quiet around the city tonight. I'm hoping that tomorrow as people get back to work, we're going to show up in numbers and start to support the society once again and the economy, most importantly. Uh, it is, uh, I'm sure it's the same problem everywhere around the world, but uh, I guess we should might as well finish with some inspirational words here at the end. The fact of the matter here is that this isn't the first or the last virus or pandemic that we're going to go through. We've been through much worse in society and with humanity. So we've been through this before and we've gotten through this with the HIV crisis and many other problems and challenges we've gone through in dentistry. Dentistry is going to be very strong soon again as we work out through some of the challenges of this new normal. 
that we're gonna go through. But I'm also sure that this may not end up being quite as the new normal. The universal precautions were excellent. It was originally designed to deal with HIV patients that had tuberculosis and AIDS patients that had multiple the respiratory problems and they proved to be very adequate. I've worked and seen patients with influenza virus and other kinds of respiratory issues in the past just using universal precautions i've never actually gotten sick from a patient only time i've been sick has been sitting on a plane next to somebody who had uh, the flu and i <laughs> caught the flu from them immediately as soon as they arrived so i think we need to go through our own type of um, moment for ourselves and realize that fear and anxiety are always present that we live in unprecedented times for access to incredible amount of information without having any context for this information has really played a number on our minds and many of us unfortunately irreversibly what we need to do is we need to kind of pull ourselves up by the bootstraps if you will and understand that we need to stand up here for the profession for ourselves for our sense of duty to our patients and we need to get over this fear and anxiety and understand that with just a little bit of logic and common sense and proper hygiene we can be the leaders that we are born to be and be able to help our patients our staff our communities and uh, get back to working and to the economy anyway guys hope you're all safe and sound wherever you are and whenever you get back to work and if you've already been write down below your comments and let me know what you've been doing and how's it been coming back i'm sure it's been pretty eerie but uh if you have any tips or tricks for improving patient flow and workflow at the office, share that with me down below in the comments, as well as with the other colleagues that are watching and you know reading these comments. Stay safe, guys.